Book fourteen, part two of the Annals by Publius Cornelius Tacitus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Annals by Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Translated by Alfred John Church and William Jackson Broadrib. Book fourteen, A.D. fifty nine through sixty two, part two. Corbulo's bravery in Armenia. Corbulo, meanwhile, having demolished Artaxata, thought that he ought to avail himself of the recent panic by possessing himself of Tigranocerta, and either by destroying it, increase the enemy's terror, or by sparing it, win a name for mercy. Thither he marched his army, with no hostile demonstrations, lest might cut off all hope of quarter, but still without relaxing his vigilance knowing, as he did, the fickle temper of the people, who are as treacherous when they have an opportunity as they are slow to meet danger. The barbarians, following their individual inclinations, either came to him with entreaties, or quitted their villages and dispersed into their deserts. Some there were who hid themselves in caverns with all that they held dearest. The Roman general accordingly dealt variously with them. He was merciful to suppliants, swift in pursuit of fugitives, pitiless towards those who had crept into hiding-places, burning them out after filling up the entrances and exits with brushwood and bushes. As he was on his march along the frontier of the Mardi, he was incessantly attacked by that tribe which is trained to guerrilla warfare, and defended by mountains against an invader. Corbulo threw the Iberians on them, ravaged their country, and punished the enemy's daring at the cost of the blood of the foreigner. Both Corbulo and his army, though suffering no losses in battle, were becoming exhausted by short supplies and hardships, compelled as they were to stave off hunger solely by the flesh of cattle. Added to this was scarcity of water, a burning summer, and long marches, all of which were alleviated only by the general's patient endurance. He bore indeed the same or even more burdens than the common soldier. Subsequently they reached lands under cultivation, and reaped the crops, and of two fortresses in which the Armenians had fled for refuge, one was taken by storm, the other, which repulsed the first attack, was reduced by blockade. Thence the general crossed into the country of the Taranites, where he escaped an unforeseen peril. Near his tent, a barbarian of no mean rank was discovered with a dagger, who divulged under torture the whole method of the plot, its contrivance by himself and his associates. The men, who under a show of friendship planned the treachery, were convicted and punished. Soon afterwards, Corbulo's envoys, whom he had sent to Tigranocerta, reported that the city walls were open, and the inhabitants awaiting orders. They also handed him a gift denoting friendship, a golden crown, which he acknowledged in complimentary language. Nothing was done to humiliate the city, that remaining uninjured it might continue to yield a more cheerful obedience. The citadel, however, which had been closed by an intrepid band of youths, was not stormed without a struggle. They even ventured on an engagement under the walls, but were driven back within their fortifications, and succumbed at last only to our siege-works and to the swords of furious assailants. The success was the easier, as the Parthenians were distracted by a war with the Hyrcanians, who had sent to the Roman Emperor, imploring alliance and pointing to the fact that they were detaining the Vologeses as a pledge of amity. When these envoys were on their way home, Corbulo, to save them from being intercepted by the enemy's piquets after their passage of the Euphrates, gave them an escort, and conducted them to the shores of the Red Sea, whence, avoiding Parthian territory, they returned to their native possessions. Corbulo, too, as Tiradates was entering the Armenian frontier through Medea, sent on Verulanus, his lieutenant-general with the auxiliaries, while he himself followed with the legions by forced marches, and compelled him to retreat to a distance and abandon the idea of war. Having harried with fire and sword all whom he had ascertained to be against us, he began to take possession of Armenia, when Tigranus arrived, whom Nero had selected to assume the sovereignty. Though a Cappadocian noble and grandson of King Archelaus, yet from having long been a hostage at Rome, he had sunk into servile submissiveness nor was he unanimously welcomed, as some still cherished a liking for the Arsacids. Most, however, in their hatred of Parthian arrogance, preferred a king given them by Rome. He was supported, too, with a force of a thousand legionaries, three allied cohorts and two squadrons of cavalry, that he might the more easily secure his new kingdom. 
parts of Armenia, according to their respective proximities, were put under the subjection of Parasmenes, Polemo, Aristobulus, and Antiochus. Corbulo retired into Syria, which province, as being vacant by the death of its governor, Umidius, was entrusted to him. One of the famous cities of Asia, Laodicea, was that same year overthrown by an earthquake, and without any relief from us, recovered itself by its own resources. In Italy, meanwhile, the old town of Puteoli obtained from Nero the privileges of a colony, with an additional name. A further enrollment of veterans in Tarentum and Antium did but little for those thinly peopled places, for most scattered themselves in the provinces where they had completed their military service. Not being accustomed to tie themselves by marriage and rear children, they left behind them homes without families. For whole legions were no longer transplanted, as in former days, with tribunes and centurions and soldiers of every grade, so as to form a state by their unity and mutual attachment, but strangers to one another from different companies, without a head or any community of sentiment, were suddenly gathered together, as it might be, out of any other class of human beings, and became a mere crowd rather than a colony. As at the elections for praetors, now generally under the Senate's control, there was the excitement of a particularly keen competition. The emperor quieted matters by promoting the three supernumerary candidates to legionary commands. He also raised the dignity of the Senate, by deciding that all who appealed from private judges to its house were to incur the same pecuniary risk as those who referred their cause to the emperor. Hitherto such an appeal had been perfectly open, and free from penalty. At the close of the year Vibius Secundus, a Roman knight, on the accusation of the Moors, was convicted of exertion, and banished from Italy, contriving, through the influence of his brother Vibius Crispus, to escape heavier punishment. In the consulship of Caesonius Paetus and Petronius Terpilianus, a serious disaster was sustained in Britain, where Aulius Didius, the emperor's legate, had merely retained for our existing possessions, and his successor, Veranius, after having ravaged the Sillers in some trifling raids, was prevented by death from extending the war. While he lived, he had a great name for manly independence, though, in his will's final words, he betrayed a flatterer's weakness, for after heaping adulation on Nero, he added that he should have conquered the province for him had he lived for the next two years. Now, however, Britain was in the hands of Suetonius Paulinus, who in military knowledge and in popular favour, which allows no one to be without a rival, vied with Corbulo, and aspired to equal the glory of the recovery of Armenia by the subjugation of Rome's enemies. He therefore prepared to attack the island of Mona, which had a powerful population and was a refuge for fugitives. He built flat-bottomed vessels to cope with the shallows and uncertain depths of the sea. Thus the infantry crossed, while the cavalry followed by fording, or, where the water was deep, swam by the side of their horses. On the shore stood the opposing army with its dense array of armed warriors, while between the ranks dashed women, in black attire like the Furies, with hair dishevelled, waving brands. All around the Druids, lifting up their hands to heaven, and pouring forth dreadful imprecations, scared our soldiers by the unfamiliar sight, so that as if their limbs were paralyzed, they stood motionless, and exposed to wounds. Then, urged by their general's appeals and mutual encouragements not to quail before a troop of frenzied women, they bore the standards onwards, smote down all resistance, and wrapped the foe in the flames of his own brands. A force was next set over the conquered, and their groves, devoted to inhuman superstitions, were destroyed. They deemed it indeed a duty to cover their altars with the blood of captives, and to consult their deities through human entrails. Suetonius, while thus occupied, received tidings of the sudden result of the province. Prasitagus, king of the Icini, famed for his long prosperity, had made the emperor his heir along with his two daughters, under the impression that this token of submission would put his kingdom and his house out of the reach of wrong. But the reverse was the result, so much that his kingdom was plundered by centurions, his house by slaves, as if they were the spoils of war. First his wife Boudica was scourged, and his daughters outraged. All of the chief men of the Inici, as if Rome had received the whole country as a gift, were stripped of their ancestral possessions, and the king's relatives were made slaves. Roused by these insults and the dread of worse, reduced as they now were into the condition of a province, they flew to arms and stirred to revolt the Trinobantes and others who, 
not yet cowed by slavery, had agreed, in secret conspiracy, to reclaim their freedom. It was against the veterans that their hatred was most intense. For these new settlers in the colony of Camelodunum drove people out of their houses, ejected them from their farms, called them captives and slaves, and the lawlessness of the veterans was encouraged by the soldiers, who lived a similar life and hoped for a similar license. A temple also erected to the divine Claudius was ever before their eyes, a citadel, it seemed, of perpetual tyranny. Men chosen as priests had to squander their whole fortunes under the pretense of a religious ceremonial. It appeared to no difficult matter to destroy the colony, undefended as it was by fortifications, a precaution neglected by our generals, while they thought more of what was agreeable than of what was expedient. Meanwhile, without any evident cause, the statue of victory at Camelodunum fell prostrate, and turned its back to the enemy, as though it fled before them. Women excited to frenzy prophesied impending destruction. Ravings in a strange tongue, it was said, were heard in their senate-house, their theatre resounded with wailings, and in the estuary of the Tamisa had been seen the appearance of an overthrown town. Even the ocean had worn the aspect of blood, and when the tide ebbed there had been left the likenesses of human forms, marvels interpreted by the Britons as hopeful, by the veterans as alarming. But as Suetonius was far away, they implored aid from the procurator, Cadus Decianus. All he did was to send two hundred men, and no more, without regular arms, and there was in the place but a small military force. Trusting to the protection of the temple, hindered, too, by secret accomplices in the revolt, who embarrassed their plans, they had constructed neither fosse nor rampart, nor had they removed their old men and women, leaving their youth alone to face the foe. Surprised, as it were, in the midst of peace, they were surrounded by an immense host of the barbarians. All else was plundered or fired in the onslaught. The temple where the soldiers had assembled was stormed after a two days' siege. The victorious enemy met Petilius Cerealis, commander of the Ninth Legion, as he was coming to the rescue, routed his troops, and destroyed all his infantry. Cerealis escaped with some cavalry into the camp, and was saved by its fortifications. Alarmed by this disaster and by the fury of the province which he had goaded into war by his rapacity, the procurator Cadus crossed over into Gaul. Suetonius, however, with wonderful resolution, marched amid a hostile population to Londinium, which, though undistinguished by the name of a colony, was much frequented by a number of merchants and trading vessels. Uncertain whether he should choose it as a seat of war, as he looked round on his scanty force of soldiers, and remembered with what a serious warning the rashness of Petilius had been punished, he resolved to save the province at the cost of a single town. Nor did the tears and weeping of the people, as they implored his aid, deter him from giving the signal of departure, and receiving into his army all who would go with him. Those who were chained to the spot by the weakness of their sex, or the infirmity of age, or the attraction of the place, were cut off by the enemy. Like ruin fell on the town of Verulamium, for the barbarians, who delighted in plunder and were indifferent to all else, passed by the fortresses with military garrisons, and attacked whatever offered most wealth to the spoiler, and was unsafe for defence. About seventy thousand citizens and allies, it appeared, fell in the places which I have mentioned. For it was not on making prisoners and selling them, or any of the barter of war, that the enemy was bent, but on slaughter, on the gibbet, the fire and the cross, like men soon about to pay the penalty, and meanwhile snatching at instant vengeance. Suetonius had the fourth legion, with the veterans of the twentieth, and auxiliaries from the neighbourhood, to the number of about ten thousand armed men, when he prepared to break off delay and fight a battle. He chose a position approached by a narrow defile, closed in at the rear by a forest, having first ascertained that there was not a soldier of the enemy except in his front, where an open plain extended without any danger from ambuscades. His legions were in close array, round them the light-armed troops, and the cavalry in dense array on the wings. On the other side, the army of the Britons, with its masses of infantry and cavalry, was confidently exulting, a vaster host than they had ever assembled, and so fierce in spirit that they actually brought with them, to witness their victory, their wives riding in wagons, which they had placed on the extreme border of the plain. Budichia, with her daughters before her in a chariot, went up to tribe after tribe, protesting that it was indeed usual for Britons to fight under the leadership of women. 
but now, she said, it is not as a woman descended from noble ancestry, but as one of the people that I am avenging lost freedom, my scourged body, the outraged chastity of my daughters. Roman lust has gone so far that not our very persons, nor even age or virginity, are left unpolluted. But heaven is on the side of a righteous vengeance. A legion which dared to fight has perished. The rest are hiding themselves in their camp, or are thinking anxiously of flight. They will not sustain even the din and the shout of so many thousands, much less our charge and our blows. If you weigh well the strength of the armies, and the causes of the war, you will see that in this battle you must conquer or die. This is a woman's resolve. As for men, they may live and be slaves. Nor was Suetonius silent at such a crisis. Though he confided in the valour of his men, he yet mingled encouragements and entreaties to disdain the clamours and empty threats of the barbarians. There, he said, you see more women than warriors. Unwarlike, unarmed, they will give way the moment they have recognised that sword and courage of the conquerors, which have so often routed them. Even among many legions, it is a few who really decide the battle, and it will enhance their glory that a small force should earn the renown of an entire army. Only close up the ranks, and having discharged your javelins, then with shields and swords continue the work of bloodshed and destruction, without a thought of plunder. When once the victory has been won, everything will be in your power. Such was the enthusiasm which followed the general's address, and so promptly did the veteran soldiery, with their long experience of battles, prepare for the hurling of the javelins, that it was with confidence in the result that Suetonius gave the signal of battle. At first the legion kept its position, clinging to the narrow defile as a defence. When they had exhausted their missiles, which they discharged with unerring aim on the closely approaching foe, they rushed out in a wedge-like column. Similar was the onset of the auxiliaries, while the cavalry, with extended lances, broke through all who offered a strong resistance. The rest turned their back in flight, and flight proved difficult, because the surrounding wagons had blocked retreat. Our soldiers spared not to slay even the women, while the very beasts of burden, transfixed by the missiles, swelled the piles of bodies. Great glory, equal to that of our old victories, was won on that day. Some indeed say that there fell little less than eighty thousand of the Britons, with a loss to our soldiers of about four hundred, and only as many wounded. Budicia put an end to her life by poison. Poenius Posthumus, too, camp prefect of the Second Legion, when he knew of the success of the men of the fourteenth and twentieth, feeling that he had cheated his legion out of like glory, and had contrary to all military usage disregarded the general's orders, threw himself on his sword. The whole army was then brought together and kept under canvas to finish the remainder of the war. The emperor strengthened the forces by sending from Germany two thousand legionaries, eight cohorts of auxiliaries, and a thousand cavalry. On their arrival the men of the ninth had their number made up with legionary soldiers. The allied infantry and cavalry were placed in new winter quarters, and whatever tribes still wavered or were hostile ravaged with fire and sword. Nothing, however, distressed the enemy so much as famine, for they had been careless about sowing corn, people of every age having gone to war, while they reckoned on our supplies as their own. Nations, too, so high-spirited inclined the more slowly to peace, because Julius Classicanus, who had been sent as successor to Catus and was at variance with Suetonius, let private animosities interfere with the public interest, and had spread an idea that they ought to wait for a new governor, who, having neither the anger of an enemy nor the pride of a conqueror, would deal mercifully with those who had surrendered. At the same time he stated in a dispatch to Rome that no cessation of fighting must be expected, unless Suetonius were superseded, attributing that general's disasters to perseverance and his successes to good luck. Accordingly, one of the imperial freedmen, Polyclitus, was sent to survey the state of Britain, Nero having great hopes that his influence would be able not only to establish a good understanding between the governor and the procurator, but also to pacify the rebellious spirit of the barbarians. And Polyclitus, who, with his enormous suite, had been a burden to Italy and Gaul, failed not, as soon as he had crossed the ocean, to make his progress as a terror even to our soldiers. But to the enemy he was a laughing-stock, for they still retained some of the fire of liberty, knowing nothing yet of the power of freedmen, and so they marvelled to see a general and an army who had finished such a war cringing to slaves. Everything, however, was softened down for the emperor's ears, and Suetonius was retained in the government, 
but as he subsequently lost a few vessels on the shore with the crews, he was ordered, as though the war continued, to hand over his army to Petronius Turpilianus, who had just resigned his consulship. Petronius neither challenged the enemy nor was himself molested, and veiled this tame inaction under the honourable name of peace. End of Book 14, Part 2